I want to thank you for coming out to the first installment for this year of the uh, Law Tech Institute's Edmund Speaker Series. My name is Rob Curry. I'm the director of the Institute, for those of you who don't know me. Um, we do this on an occasional basis throughout every year. We bring in speakers both local and national and sometimes international in order to facilitate dialogue about law and technology related matters. And today we've got a great speaker and a great topic. Uh, our speaker has cautioned me not to go on and on introducing her even though I could. So I will just say a few brief points. Uh, Mikhail Fairburn is originally from the bustling community of Beaverton, Ontario. <laughs> He's a uh, graduate of the U of T Law School and went from there to the Crown Law Office of the Ministry of the Attorney General um, in, for Ontario and was there for 25? 22. 22 years, my mistake. Uh, over the course of those 22 years, she became one of the leading criminal lawyers in Canada, uh, has gone from place to place educating criminal law adherents like judges and lawyers and is well respected for it. But a year and a half ago, I'm going to say, she made the leap to the other side of the yard. I'm not going to make any comments about good, bad, evil, good, any of that sort of thing. She's now on the other side of the divide uh, with a defense practice at the firm of Stockwoods in Ontario, in uh, Toronto. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mikhail Herbert. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Rob, for the very kind, uh, over-the-top introduction. Um, uh, I'm really delighted to be here to be speaking about this issue of technology and criminal investigations. Uh, we've seen uh, a significant uh, increase in the use of technology in criminal investigations and in prosecutions in the last number of years and indeed I don't think it would be an overstatement to suggest that it is today the rare criminal trial uh, that doesn't have some form of technology uh, in some fashion inextricably linked to it either in the way that the Crown uh, is prosecuting the case, the defense are uh, defending it with the use of technology, what's going on in the courtroom, and certainly uh, the evidentiary platform that comes before the court and how it's been developed uh, by the police, which raises all kinds of fascinating constitutional issues. We live in a world of technology, and I don't need to tell anyone in this room that. Uh, we all use it. We play with it. We work with it. And we can't live without it. Uh, and we, uh, we've seen it uh, seep into our lives so much so that there are actually uh, significant uh, statistical databases out there now about the use of technology throughout the world. And I'm just going to quickly go through some of uh, those statistics. Uh, we learned actually earlier this year uh, in January that there were 10 billion devices in the world connected to the Internet. And in fact, that number is estimated to increase to 50 billion by the year 2020, uh, which is to me a remarkable uh, statistic. And you kind of wonder, well, how can it so far exceed the population of uh, the world? And I think the answer to that is there's so many uh, devices on the internet, people have multiple devices at a time. Think about uh, and certainly, um, I know the young people in the room probably have more than one device. We've got our, oh, or see how I included myself in that young person category. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we have our iPhones, we have our, our computers, we have our iPads, and so on. And it's not unusual for people to have three, four, five devices at a time that are all internet uh, accessible. And we now communicate on electronic uh, devices and that's just the reality whether we're Skyping, we're emailing, we're text messaging, we're Twittering, uh, we're Instagramming, the, the reality is that we have moved not completely away but somewhat away uh, from the wor world of verbal communications and into the world of telecommunications and uh, communicating with one another in the written form uh, and largely through acronyms. Uh, and uh, we've seen a number of other statistical developments in this environment. Uh, for instance, one billion people, I find that incredible, one billion people are actually on Facebook. 
think about that number. <laughs> it's a staggering uh, one. Uh, and I think it makes Mark Zuckerberg very, very happy. Um, uh, in 2012, look at the statistics up on the screen in terms of Twitter user users and what's being sent every two and a half days in tweets. Again, uh, just a staggering number. What did we do without tweeting? How do we ever communicate with each other? I mean, how did we know what you were doing every second of every day? Uh, how do we know you're off to class now? It's critically important information. How did, how did people convey that before Twitter? Uh, and then, of course, these every 60 second statistics are the most staggering, without a doubt. Look at the hours of video that are uploaded to YouTube in a 60 second period. Uh, over 200 million messages are sent by email every 60 seconds in the world. Uh, incredible. Google receives over 2 million search queries in a 60 second period in the world. Th these are, again, just incredible stats. And it demonstrates, I think, and informs as to why it is that technology has become so inextricably linked with criminal investigations. Police are embedded in the technology community. They are embedded in an undercover way in the technology community uh, and in uh, seizing and searching uh, devices. And I'm going to get into that. But before I do, I just thought I'd uh, mention Riley in California um, and the sister case of worry. Because this is, if you haven't had a really fun time reading a case lately, I really do commend this particular judgment to you because it is just such a treat to read, especially when you think about the fact that five U.S. Supreme Court judges were born just before or during World War II, and they're talking about cell phone technology. Uh, and, and they get it. They, they get the privacy issues engaged uh, with the technology. But I loved this stat coming right out of the judgment. I mean, did you know that 90% of adult Americans are carrying a cell phone? Three quarters of smartphone users are within five feet of them. And then, of course, 12% are using them in the shower. Now, I don't know if anybody wants to discuss that statistic here in a public <laughs> format. I don't know what people are doing with their iPhones or smartphones in the shower. I really I can't imagine. Um, but if, uh, you know, uh, maybe to others that 12% stat, one out of just slightly over one in tw ten and 100, pe or sorry, 10 and 100 people, or one in 10, have their showers in the phone with them and are using them. O odd, um, I think, but in any event, uh, it shows how tethered we are to our technology <coughs> these days. So how has this uh, impacted criminal investigations? Uh, we've seen an evolution in the way that crime is committed, uh, and that's uh, no secret. We're actually seeing crimes, uh, old crimes, being committed in new ways. So fraud, we used to speak of boiler rooms, uh, these big international fraud schemes that were crossing borders, but crossing borders over the telephone from a boiler room where a bunch of uh, guys, usually guys, up to no good, were making calls and uh, get relieving others around the world of, of their money. That's not happening in a boiler room anymore. That's actually happening on the internet now real time. And it's being facilitated by the internet because uh, these these uh, fraudulent uh, entities can actually set up websites that look like real websites that look like, you know, sitting in Toronto, Canada. There's a big office building that actually is owned by a company where 300 employees look and it's beautiful and glossy uh, and that website looks real and in fact that is a post office box when the person from Australia can't get them back on the phone after they've sent hundred thousand dollars and decide to fly over and find the building and find it's actually not a building at all. Uh, the, the internet's facilitating that kind of thing and it's made for certain investigative uh, challenges. Child pornography is another obvious uh, area where crime has evolved with the use of uh, technology and the trafficking in child misery around the world has increased as a result of the internet and what can be sent anonymously on the internet. Uh, we have new crime uh, and here in this community I don't need to uh, remind anyone about the obviously the uh, catastrophic uh, events that can result from cyberbullying. 
uh, being the, the home of uh, Retea Parsons and this kind of new crime that we're experiencing uh, as a result of the use of technology. Uh, and other forms of crime. The Parliament is currently in the process of addressing through Bill C-13, which I'll return to close to the end of my chat. Uh, how are the police investigating in this new world of technology? There's a, uh, a significant and obvious shift in how they're going about their work. Uh, they clearly have an unprecedented window into people's lives, a window that they didn't uh, have before, because people are now communicating. Uh, in permanent electronic records. It used to be that part six of the criminal code was in it, that is the electronic surveillance uh, part of the, the criminal code was all, uh, was all uh, looked toward intercepting private communications in the form of oral communications by way of planting probes in residences or private locations, motor vehicles and so on, or intercepting phone lines, hard landlines, and today uh, the police are much more inclined to be looking to that uh, part of the criminal code uh, in order to intercept private communications, but ones that are already committed to a ele permanent electronic record because of the way people communicate, seizing their email communications, seizing uh, their uh, chats with, with others in uh, certain environments that could be considered uh, private. Hi, Joel. Uh, so uh, there's evolving uh, investigative techniques uh, that are being used. Police are constantly online in an undercover capacity. Uh, you have old male police officers who are posing as young, beautiful teenage girls, uh, actually pulling in the uh, men, often men, online who are looking for young teenage girls. and. These are, this is the new undercover work that the police are involved in. Uh, they can now pass themselves off on, online, undercover, in a way that they could have never passed themselves off in the past. And we see a host of that kind of activity going on. Uh, we also see the police using the community through the use of technology in new ways to solve crime, or at least just taking advantage of the uh, technology that's already being used out there. Uh, and we saw an example of this in the tragic events in Moncton, New Brunswick, uh, back earlier this year. Uh, we saw it during the Stanley Cup riot, and in fact, I have a, a little clip of that one that I want to show to you. It's just come up on the screen here. The use of technology in criminal investigations is so uh, impressive. What they can do now <laughs> is stitch together, and this is a Vancouver uh, police uh, image. They, they asked the community to come together, give them their photos just before the riot broke out, and they did that, and they actually stitched together over, well over 100 photos to come up with this incredibly clear image. And when you, when you actually uh, come in on this image, you can start to see faces with unbelievable clarity because of what the public provided to the police in the wake of the actual riot. And then the police asked, go in and see if you recognize anybody, and if you do, Facebook tag them for us. Would you mind? <laughs> and so that is precisely what the public did. And if you look at this image uh, you know, in, in its full glory, you will see there are hundreds of bubbles, Facebook bubbles over people's heads, uh, just like this one for poor Josh Ming. Now, I'm not suggesting Josh Ming, whoever he is, was involved in criminal wrongdoing that day, but if he was, I think it's a safe bet that the police were probably going to get him because what they could do then, because one of his friends uh, clearly <laughs> uh, decided that they do the police a great service and Facebook tag him, uh, there you go. There's Josh Ming and there's his Facebook profile. For kind of easy for the police to figure out who he is, where he is, what he's about, and to come knocking uh, if they wanted to do so. So, uh, you know, the, the, the police are using, uh, they're using technology, they're using the public uh, through the, me through the uh, means of technology in order to solve crime and identify uh, those believed to be involved in crime these days. I just want to get back to the other 
slide. Uh, alt tab. Alt tab. And now just click it from the bottom there. And click it from the bottom. Uh, you have the PowerPoint at the very bottom of the screen open. Oh, I see. Right here? Yeah. Okay. Ah, I got it. Okay, thank you. So, that's the, uh, that's the world we're living in. And the reality is, we all know, uh, it's no surprise to anybody in this room, that we leave a digital trail everywhere we go. Um, this is huge business for some companies. And uh, you can see up on the screen here that there are some private data mining companies who are actually boasting these kinds of statistics for that many internet users in the world. Huge business. And how do they collect 1,500 data points in relation to 500 million active consumers around the world? Because we leave an electronic trail every single time we get on the internet. And there's virtually no way of avoiding that. It's called metadata. We all know that metadata is uh, data about data. It gives information about uh, who's communicating with who, uh, when, for how long, and so on. And it's, it's quite simply not benign data. No, no matter what uh, some may suggest, it's not benign. Uh, if you look at uh, the statistical research that's been done and you uh, look at uh, all kinds of uh, studies that have especially been done uh, by MIT, you're going to see uh, that they have discovered that just four data points, like, like, leave alone 1,500 data points, four are going to give you, with 95% accuracy, the actual identity of the owner of a uh, phone. And in fact, they've recently determined that sexual orientation can be determined simply by a few points of metadata. This raises real issues about privacy in this new world of technology and how it is that we can protect our privacy. Uh, the law enforcement uh, know that there is a gold mine in this uh, technology. Uh, they're, they're well aware of it, and in case we have any doubt about that, we can just look at the statistics that have been released in the very recent past by the Canadian Wireless uh, Telecommunications <laughs> Association, uh, where they have uh, suggested that over a million uh, requests are put in um, from state actors every year for certain uh, information as it relates to uh, telecommunication telecommuni of their clients. Some of those requests are going to be urgent requests done without any prior authorization. Uh, some until the, the very recent past with the Spencer judgment, which I'll come to in the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, would have been for just customer name address information. And some requests are going to be to penetrate uh, even more detailed uh, information. But over a million a year, Think about our population in Canada and think about that statistic against our population. Law enforcement love this uh, world of technology that we're living in and it has made their jobs much easier. Uh, and uh, it's made it easier because people are using the technology uh, and they're using it not very smartly quite often. Being a former prosecutor, I can tell you um, that uh, in a lot of gun cases that you prosecute, for whatever reason, guys like to take pictures of themselves with their guns. It's like, whoa, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Leave it on their cell phone device, and there it is. Uh, and well, you know, whether the, the, the privacy question is whether the cell phone device has to be uh, seized and searched with prior judicial authorization, which we'll get into. Uh, but the reality is it's there. And at some point, maybe people might wake up a bit. But this is the world we're living in, and this is the conundrum uh, for, for people, given that technology keeps a record everywhere. Um, so that's the question. Has, has privacy been overtaken? Uh, and do we really have privacy in this world of technology uh, that we're living in? Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, uh, made a very controversial statement just a few years back where he said privacy is no longer a social norm. Uh, interestingly enough, he made that statement just before he bought up his four neighboring neighbors' properties around his house for millions and millions and millions of dollars because clearly for 
him, privacy is a social norm and he'd like to keep it that way. Um, but he, uh, he, he questions that in the te te world of technology. And, and Scott McNeely, uh, in charge of Sun Microsystems, uh, made a similarly controversial uh, statement back a little bit uh, previously, about 10 years ago, actually, just previous to uh, Zuckerberg, saying you have zero privacy, get over it. I mean, is that true? And, and it really begs the question whether we're living in this world of or Orwellian despair. Uh, is there any hope for privacy as we uh, go forward? And I'm going to suggest that uh, given what we've been seeing evolve from our Supreme Court of Canada in the recent past and in this world of technology as they are starting to come to grips with it, uh, that they are fighting back. Uh, and that they do have a vision of privacy even in this new world and they're not prepared to give over to these rather fatalistic uh, statements by uh, the likes of, of Zuckerberg or uh, McNeely or even George Orwell. Uh, so uh, Section 8 of the Charter is where all this action is happening and we uh, know all too well what Section 8 uh, what the right is uh, in, in Section 8 in terms of uh, keeping us secure against unreasonable search or seizure. But what does that mean in this context? And we uh, learned in 1984 the very simple proposition out of Hunter and Southam that if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, then the state needs prior judicial authorization before they can interfere with that expectation of privacy barring a uh, warrantless search doctrine uh, being operative. And, and the warrantless search doctrines tend to be, uh, or the most commonly uh, resorted to ones, tend to be these up on the, the screen. So if there's consent, uh, there's no need for prior judicial authorization. If something's been abandoned, like garbage, out at the curbside, not on the property, so there's a territorial privacy issue, but at the curbside, you know, you, you've given up your privacy interest in it. Uh, exigent circumstances are always going to overtake the privacy interests where they're sufficiently exigent, where the police haven't triggered the exigency uh, sufficient to uh, allow for an interference with a privacy interest without prior judicial authorization. But for the most part, unless one of these warrantless search doctrines are operative, prior judicial authorization is needed where there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. But when is there a reasonable expectation of privacy is the question. And the court has uh, grappled with that concept over the years. We all know the Edwards judgment from 1996 where the court spoke of the subject of privacy interests of the individual as ob objectively uh, informed by the totality of circumstances. So if an individual has a subject of privacy interest, it is objectively reasonable in the circumstances, all of the circumstances at play, then there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. The person becomes cloaked in Section 8 charter protection and barring a warrantless search doctrine or a prior judicial authorization, uh, the uh, state interference with that privacy interest will uh, trigger a Section 8 breach. But is that simplistic analysis coming out of Edwards that took root in 1996 and served us well, I think served individuals, Canadians well for so many years, does it work in this day and age? To ask, do you have a subject of privacy interest? Is it objectively reasonable in the circumstances? Does it work in the age of technology? And I think what we're learning from our Supreme Court of Canada is that it has to be a much more nuanced much more complex analysis. That gone are the days of the Mr. Edwards who uh, was an individual charged in relation to uh, a drug and, and uh, weapons related matter. Uh, he had stored some of his things at his girlfriend's apartment and you know, out of that factual scenario where territorial privacy, not informational privacy, but territorial privacy is at play, you get this analysis. Uh, but does it work in the context of informational privacy? And uh, we've recently seen in the Spencer judgment in the Supreme Court of Canada, was just released earlier this year in, in June of, of 2014, that it does have to be more nuanced, that it's not just about those factors, that we have to really ask ourselves, and I'll return to this theme, but what 
do we as a democratic nation uh, deserve and want in terms of our privacy interests? So when we're looking at a case like Spencer, Mr. Spencer was uh, charged and ultimately convicted of uh, trafficking in, in child pornography. A lot of these technology cases sadly uh, and disturbingly arise in the child pornography context. Uh, he uh, was concerned. Um, he was Section 8 concerned because what happened was information came into the possession of the police that a certain IP address, internet protocol address, which is three digits, period, three digits, period, three digits, it's just a number, uh, that, that that address was associated with child pornography. The police, through public means, were able to determine where uh, that address uh, was associated to and which service provider. Go to the service provider and make what's at the time called a law enforcement request, an LER, the acronym for it. Uh, and that law enforcement request was as simple as tell us the name and the address associated with whoever it is that uh, belongs to this IP address. That simple. So all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the question is, is a name and an address privacy protected? Does it deserve Section 8 uh, charter protection? And if we think about it through an, an Edwards lens, that simplistic sort of, can you have a subjective privacy interest in your name? Well, I don't think anybody's name in this room is a secret. <laughs> You're given a name for the precise reason that we can all address each other by name. That's, that's the whole point of having a name. Uh, same thing with your address. You take mail at your address. You entertain visitors at your address. You know, people come up and knock on your door. Your address tends not to be private. But the Supreme Court of Canada said, when assessing uh, all of the jurisprudence that came before on this point, because it was quite divided around the country, ultimately said, that misses the mark. That's not what it's really about. It's about ensuring that we as Canadians can maintain a sphere of privacy uh, despite the advances in technology. And this isn't just about a name and address. This is about a name and address that is going to tell us something about what that name does on the internet. And it is the connection of those two concepts uh, that for the Supreme Court of Canada was the concern and therefore the privacy interest was engaged under Section 8 of the Charter. And it is the court saying essentially that in this age of technology we need to be more nuanced. We need to be more careful about how we approach these issues to understand the technology and to understand ultimately as a democratic nation what is at risk. Uh, and so the court in Spencer, but also in other cases uh, dealing with technology in the last few years, has started to come to grips with both the quantitative and qualitative differences uh, in technology, in iPhones, in computers. Uh, in iPads, all of these technological devices we use and their potential to tell the state uh, something about the individual. Because after all, a, a cell phone in today's day and age, for the most part, certainly an iPhone, certainly a smartphone, is not just a phone. It's a library. It is a photo library. It might have every single photo near and dear to your family's life on it. Uh, it is going to have messages on it. It's going to have text messages on it. It's going to have email communications on it. And on and on and on. And it's not simply good enough to just call that a phone now because it isn't just a phone. We saw in the VU judgment last year, the Supreme Court of Canada come to grips with this through the unanimous judgment of Justice Cromwell. Uh, and in view, the issue was as follows. Mr. Uh, well, there was a grow up, big surprise in Vancouver uh, in a residential address. Uh, and the police went in with a warrant. Uh, the warrant had on it, among other things, on the shopping list, on the face of it, uh, that the police could search for and seize any documentation 
relating to essentially ownership and control. And that's you know what, what ultimately uh, the cops are wanting because that's how they're going to uh, determine who's responsible for the, the grow up. The cops go in, they haven't asked on the face of the warrant and haven't received authorization to seize any electronic devices. Uh, so they go in uh, and they, lo and behold they find a computer, in fact they find a couple of uh, computers and they also find a cell phone and on one of those computers uh, Mr. Vu had the great misfortune of having uh, some information that clearly identified him, including a resume. Uh, and uh, I guess he was looking for other lines of employment as well. So uh, he, uh, he, 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 he took issue with this in, in the trial court uh, and actually had great success in the trial court in suggesting that, well, there wasn't a computer on the face of the warrant and therefore this breached my Section 8 interest. Uh, the, the issue, though, was one of plain view because we all know uh, that uh, on the face of a warrant, as long as the police are lawfully positioned in the home, which they were in this, play, in this case, uh, they can seize anything that is in plain view, not vu, uh, plain view uh, in relation to uh, what it is uh, that they're investigating, as long as it's related to that investigation. And in this case, that was the Crown's position. Well, you know what, the computer was there, this had this relevant information on it, it's clearly like a document related to uh, possession and control, and we could take it. And the court says, no, that's not going to work in this age of technology. And it's not going to work in this age of technology because computers are quite simply different. And we're not going to treat them like other things. Computers are different because, A, uh, they store an immense, and I think that probably is an understatement, but an immense amount of information. Uh, they're also different because they store information that the user doesn't even know they're storing. So what's in the cache of a computer? Uh, every search that you've done, in the, unless you're deleting your searches, and frankly even if you're deleting your searches, they're probably there to a creative and, uh, and productive and um, motivated investigator, forensic uh, computer investigator after the fact. Uh, you try to delete a file on a computer, it's not deleted, it's going to sit in the uh, residual area of the computer and it's going to sit there for the rest of time unless that space is needed on the computer. You can't really delete from a computer, which is precisely why as a defense lawyer, uh, you know, I've, I've learned from all my previous life and work as a prosecutor that I would never tell a client to take their computer to get it fixed. If your computer has a problem, just, okay, the computer's done, go get a new one. <laughs> Don't get rid of the computer, <laughs> into the basement, <laughs> done. Uh, so you, you, uh, the, the, everything is going to be there, uh, is the operative assumption for the rest of, of time. And then finally, what is the location of a computer? The Supreme Court of Canada has recognized, I think in a fairly sophisticated analysis, that the location of computer is so unpredictable. It's not just the physical device, it's whatever the physical device is connected to and what a gold mine for the police is that. Uh, the cloud, if the computer is connected to it, uh, that is also information that's accessible to law enforcement. Uh, whatever you have access to by your computer uh, and wherever you've stored your information, uh, whatever that cloud is, wherever that cloud is, uh, is also going to be on essentially that computer when the police go into it. So the court has said we're not going to treat computers like filing cabinets because they aren't like filing cabinets. We're not going to treat them just like photo albums because they're not like that. They are different and they are deserving of different rules. And we're starting to see this evolution of new rules come out of the Supreme Court of Canada. So in VU, the answer was while the police could take the computer and the electronic devices from the home and store them in some uh, police facility, preserving the integrity of the possible evidence on the device, they had to go and get separate authorization to enter the device, which begs the question, 
what does that authorization look like? And the police are now really uh, struggling with trying to determine how to uh, apply for warrants in order to enter these electronic devices in a way that's going to comply with uh, technological demands. Uh, including whether or not they should have protocols about how the search goes down, in what way it goes down. In VU, there was a suggestion that protocols are not constitutionally required, but they might be a good idea. When Usually when the Supreme Court of Canada says not constitutionally required, but might be a good idea, that's a hint in terms of how the jurisprudence is going to evolve, and I think law enforcement would be wise to uh, be going down that path uh, now. Now, coming back to Riley for a moment, um, I just thought I'd point out that our court, a much younger and more vibrant court than the US Supreme Court, uh, is completely in sync uh, with, with uh, the, the US Supreme Court. So where Justice Cromwell on the previous slide in VU said these are all of the differences between electronic devices and, and uh, other things that the police are dealing with and seizing, in Riley, I thought Chief Justice Roberts really made a, a very uh, interesting and gripping statement here when he was commenting on the prosecutor's position in Riley that a cell phone seized incident to arrest uh, is materially indistinguishable from searches of other kinds of physical items, like, uh, for instance, um, address books and, and so on. Um, and the Chief Justice said, well, that was like saying a ride on horseback is materially indistinguishable from a flight to the moon. Both are ways of getting from point A to point B, but little else justifies lumping them together. And this is definitely an instance where both Supreme Courts seem to have uh, come together uh, in terms of their thinking on that issue. Uh, Morelli really started the ball rolling in this uh, area of technology from the Supreme Court of Canada. So in 2010, and you, and you know, um, I, I think historically it's very interesting to observe uh, that this is the first important technology case from the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, and I think it caught everybody off guard. And you know that to be the case because look how many uh, Attorney General interveners there were in Morelli. Zero. Nobody saw this coming. Uh, it looked like a standard CP child pornography case. It looked like it was just going to be run of the mill. It was going to be looking into what the grounds were for an information to obtain a search warrant related to a computer. Maybe a few kind of interesting but old hat 24-2 issues, whatever. Uh, Morelli comes out in the legal world from a technology perspective was uh, really shaken because the first few paragraphs of Morelli tell the story. It's Justice Fish uh, and he says clearly and loudly um, that it's difficult to imagine a search that is more extensive or invasive than a search essentially of a private computer. Now, I think we could debate about whether there's more invasive searches. I've always thought Mr. Graff who was the subject of a body cavity search uh, at an airport might take some issue with whether or not it's uh, you know, difficult to imagine a more invasive search <laughs> than of a computer. He might have chosen his uh, computer given, given the choice to be searched. Um, but in any event, uh, it is a demonstration, and I think a very clear demonstration, that the Supreme Court of Canada is prepared to protect technology, uh, that they are concerned with technology, and they're concerned with where uh, this is all going to take us in, in terms of our privacy interests if we don't get on top of it. And we have seen this statement uh, restated by the court uh, since Morelli in a number of judgments, uh, including uh, the Cole judgment, which I will come to. So what's this done to the plain uh, view doctrine? I've, I've uh, discussed VU and the new approach under VU. I just wanted to very quickly advert to the Fearon uh, judgment, which will be coming out of the Supreme Court of Canada, um, coming to a home near you very soon. And Fearon is going to tell the story in terms of whether we're going to have a new search incident to arrest doctrine uh, in the context of searching cell devices. So the search incident to arrest doctrine is as old as the hills in this country. 
Uh, we know it well. Uh, it is a doctrine that says that when an individual is lawfully arrested, that they can be searched and things in and around the immediate vicinity of the individual can be searched as long as there is essentially a nexus between the purpose of the arrest, it is lawful, the lawful arrest, I should be clear, uh, and the purpose of the search. Police don't need reasonable grounds to believe that what they're searching is going to yield evidence of the crime. They can simply search it as long as there is a nexus. That nexus has to be attached to some form of evidence that might inform what they've been arrested for, or it could inform safety concerns for public or police safety in the context of that arrest. But that's in essence the doctrine. Fast forward into the world of technology we, we now live in, and individuals who are getting arrested, not surprisingly, have cell phone devices on them all the time now. That's just the reality. One of the first things I learned when I went into uh, defense work over a year ago now is to tell a client who's going to turn themselves in, don't go in with any devices on your body. Do you, do you understand? Do you leave your cell phone at home? Leave your Blackberry at home? Leave your iPad? Everything. Don't go near the police with your uh, <coughs> electronic devices because they can clearly seize them. That's not the debate. The debate is whether they can search them without prior judicial authorization. And uh, Fearon will resolve this debate. Uh, there is divided jurisprudence in this country on the issue of whether the historical search incident to arrest doctrine applies or whether we need to tweak that doctrine for purposes of electronic devices. My bet, uh, and I actually don't typically bet on Supreme Court of Canada cases because I'm, I'm often wrong, uh, but on this one, I really, really think that the Crown is going to uh, probably not succeed in their position on this, that the cell phone device seized incident to arrest is deserving of the same treatment uh, as everything else seized incident to arrest. I think there is going to be a requirement for prior judicial authorization to get into the device. I do think there's probably some uh, reasonable debate to be had in terms of whether the police can take a cursory look at the device uh, at the time of arrest, but I, I, my prediction is uh, that probably we're going to come out with a rule that is specific to the world of technology and one that very much aligns itself with what we've seen in VU and these new rules that have evolved. Uh, in terms of uh, coal, I think uh, this, some might suggest, and I don't think unreasonably, is m perhaps the high water mark of where the Supreme Court of Canada has been in this new world of technology simply because of the facts that underlay uh, this judgment, again, of Justice Fish of uh, the Supreme Court. So Mr. Cole, as you may know, was a high school teacher, and he was issued a laptop uh, through his employment. So it wasn't his laptop, it was the board's laptop. Uh, and he was also uh, bound by certain contractual agreements, uh, which is a fascinating area in this evolving uh, jurisprudence in terms of how much the uh, contract plays into informing the privacy interest. So he's got these contracts and they include things like you can use your laptop for your own personal things, uh, but bear in mind uh, that essentially the information on the laptop can be accessed at any point any point. That's a, then in a nutshell, it's a little more uh, complex than that, but in a nutshell I think that covers it. And when it comes to Mr. Cole's uh, computer, true to what uh, the authorized uh, user agreement uh, said, uh, his laptop uh, information was accessed at one point by someone cleaning up uh, the, the school's uh, electronic information because there was something uh, going wrong in the system and everybody's information was being looked at and what the problem was. And lo and behold, Mr. Cole has child pornography. Mr. Cole, the teacher, has child pornography on his, his school computer. And oh, by the way, it was actually child pornography of a, stu a student in the school. Okay, so I think those are pretty interesting facts to assess the privacy interest against. And yet, 
Despite all of that and, and that backdrop, Mr. Cole was found to have a privacy interest in his computer. And we uh, saw this statement of Justice Fish's come out of uh, Cole, that his personal use of his work-issued laptop generated information that is meaningful, intimate, and organically connected to his biographical core. Now, um, that's a that's a big statement in my view in against this factual backdrop. We all know about uh, information connected to a biographical core. That's language that the court in Cole has taken from the 1993 judgment of the Supreme Court in Plant. Uh, again, a marijuana grow operation. Mr. Plant had the perfect name for uh, that case. I think his name actually was enough to get the warrant in that case. Uh, sufficient grounds, but you know, uh, the courts actually up the ante here. We're no longer talking about information connected to a biographical core. We're talking about being organically connected to the biographical core, uh, and and in this this context, and so I think the point is the lesson arising out of coal uh, is very much that the court's serious about this technology, that they are pushing back on uh, these the, these attempts by law enforcement to penetrate uh, this sphere of privacy that the court is giving. Uh, a generous interpretation to, and uh, they're prepared to apply Section 8 in a way that historically might not have been done. If you apply a true Edwards analysis to those coal facts, I'm not sure we would have ended up where we are in coal today. Just that standard, did Mr. Cole really have a subject of privacy interest in that computer? It's, it's his school computer. The court was prepared to accept that he, he did, but was it objectively reasonable? Or is this more about the normative approach to Section 8 of the Charter? And I think we're starting to see in the jurisprudence the evolution of this concept of a value-laden approach to Section 8 of the Charter. Who do we want to be as a country? What do we want to be as a country? How does privacy intersect uh, with that? And so uh, the, the richest discussion of that, and I'm going to give you a slide in just a minute, is actually most recently in Spencer. But I think we're moving uh, toward, and some might even say back, uh, to this normative approach. Early in the 90s, Justice Laforge, who I consider to be one of the greatest visionaries uh, when it comes to Section 8 of, of the Charter and to who we owe a, a huge debt of gratitude uh, in the early days in terms of the evolution of, of this area of the law, I think predicted uh, that we were going to ultimately get into uh, these issues. And he was supportive of approaching the, the uh, Section 8 of the Charter uh, in a flexible way, in an open and broad way, and uh, in one that ensured uh, that we maintained our free and democratic uh, society. And so we can see uh, Justice Laforge in the Wong judgment. And Wong, um, I'll remind you, is the, the case, as I'm sure you know, where you have uh, the individual who's rented out the hotel room, and he's essentially running a gaming operation from the hotel room. And uh, there's, a, there's a real uh, issue about whether or not, even though you're inviting others to come into a hotel room that's being used as a gaming operation, uh, whether or not there's a privacy interest in that hotel room. And ultimately, uh, Chief Justice LeMaire and Justice McLaughlin, as she w then was, they hook up together uh, in the majority judgment to find there wasn't one. But Justice Laforge, on his own here, uh, talked about, and this is in 1990, remember, talked about uh, keeping pace with technological developments and making sure that we have an approach to Section 8 of the Charter that is going to uh, take appropriate care of uh, the advancements in technology as they come up. And back then he's talking about a very rudimentary camera that had been installed in a hotel room uh, almost 25 years ago. But we saw this theme start to come up again in Tesling, uh, where Justice Binney called it, and Tesling is the FLIR case, uh, forward-looking infrared uh, technology was used in order to 
Again, um, look uh, to heat emanations from a roof in the context of a grow up uh, investigation. And Justice Binney talked about the expectation of privacy being a normative concept. Uh, and, and it's not simply a factual inquiry. It's not just simply a descriptive standard. It's something uh, where we have to determine who we are and, and what we want to be. And he, Justice Binney again and Patrick, revisits this concept. And Patrick is the, is the garbage case uh, where the garbage is left out at the curbside. Uh, and uh, the, the issue is whether or not the police, by reaching into the territorial privacy of the individual, and quite literally, the police had to reach across the property line to pick up those bags of garbage and haul them away, whether or not Mr. Patrick uh, had a privacy interest in the territory, in that airspace that they reached into to grab the bags that had been left at the curbside, but technically on his property. Uh, and whether or not he had a privacy interest in the information uh, yielded from the garbage. And ultimately the court decided that he had abandoned the garbage and he didn't have a privacy interest. But nonetheless, there's a, a beautiful discussion in Patrick by Justice Binney about what Section 8 of the Charter is about and being concerned with the long-term consequences of judgments from the court and how they're approaching the privacy analysis. So again, moving a little bit away from that rigid, rigid Edwards analysis, that theme of subject of privacy interests as objectively assessed with the constellation of factors and more into this almost second analysis after you go through all of that, asking yourself about does this fit with who we want to be, what we want to be. Uh, and then we have Ward, and uh, Justice Doherty decides Ward in the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, just back a few years ago, and it, it raised the Spencer issue. It is the customer name address uh, case, and it was probably the most significant one before the Supreme Court of Canada uh, determined the issue in Spencer. And here, uh, Justice Doherty uh, made certain observations about value judgments, how he interpreted what Justice Binney was uh, saying in, uh, in Patrick uh, and indeed in Tesling, what he meant by a normative approach, and how we should now be approaching Section 8 of the Charter in this world of technology. And ultimately, uh, he decides uh, that really Section 8 should engage in the analysis this whole issue, this whole question about what we want to be in contemporary Canadian society, bearing in mind all of these advances in, in technology. And with that analysis, uh, he is clear that we have to move on from Edwards, we have to be true to Edwards, but we have to really look at this second step even after we emerge from an Edwards analysis. And Justice Cromwell and Spencer picks it up, he agrees with Justice Doherty, he applies Ward, uh, and gets to the ultimate conclusion, uh, which is uh, really foundational in terms of where we're at today, I think, on Section 8 of the Charter in terms of technology. That you can actually have anonymity, it is a constitutionally protected interest, and it's anonymity <laughs> in public spaces. Uh, public spaces on the internet, that you have a constitutional right to that. Uh, and that's new, and in my view, that's a seismic shift in the law. Uh, and it's an important shift in the law because it creates all manner of uh, interesting investigative challenges for the police in terms of how they approach uh, their work. I think this is just the beginning of a wave. We're going to see all kinds of issues now arise out of other forms of investigative work uh, in the area of technology. Think about the undercover uh, police officer who's online uh, speaking to somebody. The officer is anonymous. The individual he or she is speaking with is hoping to be anonymous, wanting to be anonymous. Is there a penetration of their constitutionally protected right to privacy in that environment? Uh, and uh, I think we're going to see uh, this as the beginning of, of a new concept. I think uh, there's 
especially for younger people in the room. All kinds of work to be had there. No worries, you're going to be gamefully employed for a, a very long uh, time. And uh, what Justice Cromwell, ultimately looking at the bottom of the screen, has said in Spencer is that this is a significant privacy interest. It's not just a privacy interest, it's a significant one, the right to anonym, in, anonymity. Why am I having trouble with that word today? <laughs> Somebody else say it for me next time. <laughs> uh, in, in the uh, technological environment. And uh, that it is important to our ability to flourish, essentially, the individual flourishing in a democratic society. So where does it leave in law enforcement? It leaves them with a lot of uncertainty, I think, and it leaves them with a lot of work to do. All of these cases combined, I think, uh, lead to a conclusion that law enforcement would be well advised uh, when dealing with technology. And we'll see what Fearon says. It's not going to be much longer. I, I think we're going to see it pretty soon. Uh, but they'd be well advised to use prior judicial authorization. I sometimes wonder from a practical perspective how protective that is for the individual. Uh, you know, perhaps this is just putting my old hat on, but you know, law enforcement thinks that the sky fell uh, when VU was decided. Uh, when the court said, oh, computers are different, electronic devices are different, and therefore, you know, you can take them, you can secure the integrity of them, but you have to get a warrant before you enter them. But the warrant is going to be obtained. <laughs> and, you know, there's no question the grounds are there. Uh, when you have a computer device in a location to be searched and you're looking for documents that have already been authorized to be seized, chances are that computer, at least there's going to be credibly based probability, which is the threshold that they have to rise to in order to get prior judicial authorization, it's going to be met. So it really begs the question, what, what is the point? Well, the point is Hunter and Southam says you need prior judicial authorization to go in, and, and that's important, and we have to stay true to that. But at the end of the day, it's a ton of work for law enforcement, and to what end? I think the answer to the what end is ultimately going to be search protocols. I think they're coming. Uh, I don't think there's any question about it, because if we're looking for one document related to possession and control, for instance, uh, and you're entering a computer that has, we all know if you printed everything out on that computer, every single thing, it is going to like well exceed the height of this building. If you stacked it all up, it's probably going to be 20 of these buildings. Protocols are coming, uh, the, and the court is going to be addressing that issue. They have to be, because it can't be that law enforcement can just go in and search everywhere for one document. There has to be a meaningful way to limit that intrusion into that uh, technological space to be more defined and be more careful in terms of what it is uh, that they're searching for. Uh, where does it leave Parliament? I think it leaves them with a lot of work to do. Um, right now, parts 6 and 15 of the Criminal Code are wholly inadequate to the task, and they're a, uh, and I say with respect, a, a ridiculous labyrinth of provisions. These are only the sections that relate to, you know, things that you can get in order to get at technology. I mean, there's all kinds of other, as we know, search provisions. Uh, but within part uh, six, you know, it's like a grab bag of potential sections in order to uh, get at uh, private communications through electronic surveillance. Uh, but none of them are up to the task, really, of seizing email communications, of seizing text message communications. There is more time spent debating in law enforcement what the right criminal code provision is. Are we under Part 15 of the Criminal Code? Are we under Part 6 of the Criminal Code? Is this a private communication? If it's a private communication, is it one that has already crystallized in a form where it is sitting somewhere and can just be seized, just like the old letter could be seized? Or does it have, you know, is it a real-time communication? We saw the court recently debate this in the TELUS judgment. Uh, in the last couple of years where a general warrant was used in order to get prospective, what was thought to be prospective uh, text messaging on a go-forward basis and whether or not that was appropriate or whether it had to be a wiretap authorization. The reality is Parliament has to tackle this to the ground. 
uh, and they need to consolidate some of these provisions and they need to uh, give a more meaningful approach even within part 15 of the criminal code 487 it's your old standard warrant but you can seize computer data under 2.1 and 2.2 but you can also get it under 48701 a general warrant and on and on and on they need to uh, really provide more user-friendly pro provisions and they need to be uh, provisions that accommodate what it, information it is that the police are after. So if we look at C-13, and we all know C-13 as in part uh, the bill uh, that is proposing the new cyberbullying provisions, uh, and that it would appear this government is, is quite keen on uh, pursuing. It also has all of these new provisions. I mean, I can barely count as high as these uh, provisions, but this is the idea. They're all going to be inserted into Part 15 of the Criminal Code. And what I find very interesting every time I look at Bill C-13 is uh, how many of those are driven by reasonable grounds to suspect threshold as opposed to a reasonable grounds to believe threshold. And a lot of them are in relation to uh, things like metadata uh, and, and so on. And again, metadata is not really benign information and it begs the question, is this going to be found to be constitutionally uh, appropriate or constitutionally up to the, the task in terms of the jurisprudence and certainly in terms of the wave of authorities that have been coming out of the Supreme Court of Canada in the last few years if it is in fact uh, passes and is proclaimed in force. So um, that's really what I thought I would cover in my uh, hour the this afternoon and I thought that we could just open it up to questions, comments, have a bit of a dialogue about some of these issues and um, really feel free. So let me jump in just to say that uh, Mikhail has to get on a plane at 4.30 so I'm going to say 10-12 minutes or so for questions and she has to get into a cab and get out to her airport which is in another time zone as you know. Uh, so, yeah, we'll say 10 or 12 minutes, okay, otherwise sure. you, you have yeah, to I'm happy. Yep. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in your comments and assessment of the Gombach case, the digital recording ammeter case, mm -hmm. where you know, they went all over the map, at least the majority did, in terms of uh, saying that there's no privacy interest, um, and then that there's a licensing agreement with Calgary Power, and in the end, you know, police can do what they want, but DRA is so. Yeah, uh, I found it actually a very interesting decision. So the majority judgment of Justice um, Deschamps, uh, speaking for four of them, I thought was fascinating. And I think it's a very important one. I, I mentioned this contract situation and how it's informing Section 8 in this context these days. And I think Gombach is the really the beginning of a very rich discussion on that issue. Because uh, as Justice Deschamps said for the majority, the, it's actually a, a, a regulation. It's actually in legislation in the Gombach uh, decision. Um, so she's looking at that and she says, well, look, this is one of the factors that we're going to look at. Uh, but it, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't inform the privacy analysis in a dispositive way, but rather becomes one of the things that we look at in this totality of circumstances and ultimately finds, bearing in mind those totality of circumstances, that there's no privacy uh, interest. I thought it was interesting because Justice Abella uh, in, a, in the minority judgment said, no, the, the uh, legislation or the regulation at issue in Gombach uh, which is one that essentially says, if you don't want us to share this information, you need to tell us, essentially. Like, who? I can't find a regulation. Like, honestly, that's what, you know, younger lawyers are for in my office. <laughs> find me the right regulations. I, get, I mean, who, what member of the public knows what the regulation says, really? Uh, so, but she, she said, just as Bella, well, you know what, that's dispositive of the privacy analysis. Um, and I thought that was very interesting when just um, a couple of years later we see in Cole uh, the court commenting on 
uh, the AUP in that case, the authorized uh, user agreement that, that was uh, operative and, uh, and saying essentially just one of, of many factors to consider. So I think that um, ultimately what, how Gombach has been applied by the court is through the lens of De Justice Deschamps uh, majority judgment. Uh, for the plurality and I think that what we're going to see go forward is this is just one of the considerations in Spencer look at those contractual provisions that were in place I mean it really it's it, it's stunning um, look at them even in in Ward uh, and yet they don't drive the privacy analysis at the end of the day. And I think that's the court just taking a very common sense approach in this age of technology. I mean, really, seriously, a show of hands, how many people read before they click that I agree? Like, I usually forget the I agree, and, and I just, I click, and then it goes, no, you forgot to click the I agree. Okay, okay, I agree. Um, so, you know, I think... But we have one, very good. That's impressive, actually. <laughs> okay, you <laughs> do too. But really, do, or do you have much of a choice, I guess, is the other question. It's another, I think, um, very practical uh, approach by the court because you know, what telecommunication provider isn't putting into their contracts these days uh, that they're going to cooperate with the police if the police come knocking or indeed if their service is being used for improper purposes like child pornography that they're not going to go knocking on the police door and there's a very good reason for that the telecommunication provider is facilitating the commission of a criminal offense uh, and indeed it is a crime for them to have on their service child pornography so they have to cooperate in these circumstances whether it's the police initiating that cooperation or them uh, coming back over. So, you know, under uh, the, the, under Pipeta, I think they, they technically are uh, out from under the usual pains and constraints of Pipeta. They can cooperate. The question is how the police get at it constitutionally. And how they get at it constitutionally, I think, is with prior judicial authorization post Spencer. That's the end of it. So while it would be lawful under Pipeta, to give it, even without a warrant, it's not charter compliant for the police to take it, essentially. I th that's how I see Spencer shaking out, and I think the genesis of that discussion is in Gombok. Do you think that in the future there's just going to be a general idea that when a search warrant is filed, you're just going to include a section in there and that automatically say, well, we're going to search any electronic uh, devices that are yeah. in the area? Because I mean, that would kind of yeah, I think that's a very interesting question, and I wouldn't at all be surprised to see that. And uh, I think that actually it could happen. And the reason for that is, you know, again, the police thought, oh my God, you know, the sky is falling post view. But the reality is, if you look at StatsCan from 2010, over 79% of residences today have a computer that is connected to the internet. So if that's the case, that is more than what we call reasonable grounds to believe credibly based probability that you're going to come across an electronic device in that location. So again, it sort of begs those practical issues about, I get it, like, there should be prior judicial authorization, and for, but it's going to happen. So for me, where is the, uh, uh, where, where is the room for movement in the world of protocols? And I think they're coming. Prior to judicial authorization, I mean, presumably you can say, you can search the computer for evidence related to the grow-up, but if you also happen to find child pornography on the computer, isn't that the real, sort of whatever gets the rose? Can you get the judicial authorization covered, you know, unlimited crime? No. I would thought not. No, you can't. So you need reasonable grounds to believe in relation to the specific crime, and you have to be looking for evidence related to that crime. But we learned in a case called Jones in the Ontario Court of Appeal back a few years ago, which has really been applied, I think, uh, coast to coast si since Jones, that where the police, so in, in Jones, for instance, they've got a warrant to seize a computer, to search a computer as it relates to um, an online fraud, essentially. And it's exactly your scenario. They come and they're, they're allowed to look for certain documents relative to that fraud, 
they come across child pornography. Um, and they, they actually got Crown advice. It was back a number of years ago, and the Crown said, well, it's the plain view doctrine. You're lawfully positioned vis-a-vis -vis that computer. You can keep searching. You came across it innocently. Go, go for it. Fill your boots. Um, ultimately, the Ontario Court of Appeal said, no, uh, you can't do that. Once they came across the child pornography, they did it while engaged in a bona fide search as it related to the fraud that they were investigating. So it was fine to come across the actual child pornography, but the minute they did, they had to freeze that computer, go back and get judicial authorization to continue searching it now for this new purpose, the child pornography investigation. So to answer your question, it has to be a very focused warrant in the first instance, but it doesn't mean that they're precluded from, you know, investigating what they come across. They just have to get further authorization to do it. Because the plain view doctrine is actually a doctrine uh, that is uh, essentially one informed by uh, the, the fact of uh, like what you've legitimately found when you're looking at it, but you can't continue to search for that thing under the doctrine. How do you, how do you think the, uh, the any search documents or things like that are going to come up against encryption where people are purposely making documents, like maybe evidence that is, that is being searched for, mm -hmm. impossible or near impossible to obtain our password, which in most cases cannot be deciphered even by the best computers if it's done correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, so would that be considered, um, is, that, is that technically destroying evidence when you go that far and say it, or is it just concealing evidence? Or how, how is that? Yeah, I, there's a real debate about that. Uh, firstly, I have to say, you know, working um, in the area of search and electronic surveillance for a long time uh, with the province of Ontario, it was virtually never a circumstance where that happened. Um, one of the only pieces of technology that's really, really tough uh, is actually BlackBerry RIM technology, and it's only in relation to a very small category of that. Other than that, I, you know what, everything is breakable. Um, but will, will um, it evolve to that point? Maybe. And I think that's going to beg really interesting issues about self-incrimination. Because if the only way to get at, behind it is to get the password, or, you know, I've debated in the past, what about computers that can only be opened up with the thumbprint? Can you get a general warrant to take the individual's thumb and place it on? <laughs> you know, uh, and we've done it. Uh, it's happened. Uh, and so, but it's, you know, there are real self-incrimination issues embedded in those those questions. So you just hope that the police, if you know that's the side of the fence that you're on, uh, can stay ahead of the technology. And if you're on the other side, maybe you hope the opposite. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'm not sure where, where I am these days in my new world. But uh, just on this question of uh, whether you can get a warrant that covers the computers or the cell phones that happen to be in the house. What do you think Boo says about how much you have to say in that initial warrant to go into the house about, ultimately, about the cell phones, like, or, or the computers? Certainly, you know, there's probably going to be computers and cell phones in the house, multiple devices. But um, does Boo require a second warrant once you get those? And if not, what what's required in that first warrant? Like, you right. can't just write, we're going to seize the cell phones. Like, what do they have to say in the ITO? Like, how much? And right. what's the best practice they Oh my gosh, I, you know what, I think that is such a tough question because historically we, uh, a warrant uh, is directed at a location. That's a whole concept of warrants. So if we are going to search, you know, a location, but the location is going to sometimes be relative to information. So, you know, if it's going to be the ISP, it's for information related to X. But in a house situation, the location is 123 East Street. And, but the way that the court, and I think this really is what you're referring to, and, and I'm, I'm of, of multiple minds on it. The, the court of view has treated the computer like a location and the contents of the computer like information. So if 123 East Street is your location, what, what's the computer then? It has to be a thing that's being seized from the location. But it doesn't fit with our historical conceptualization of how we approach those things. So are you getting a warrant to get into 123 East Street and then a warrant to get into the, like, and then to seize the computer and then another warrant to get into the computer because now your computer becomes your location back at the police station. And 
I think that to answer the question, all the best you can do if you want to do it in one warrant, um, and this is kind of really putting on my old hat, but I think what you'd have to do is really invent a new Form 5 like warrant under the criminal code. So you'd have to say 123 is, is my location. Uh, the thing to be seized is the computer. And then after in possession of the computer, these are the things that are to be looked for in the computer. And then if you're getting into protocols, and these are the terms and conditions. And there is some uh, support in the jurisprudence for warrants that can, like even historical type location warrants, 487 warrants. Uh, for terms and conditions. So, you know, um, classic ones are like the media kind of warrants. So we see that in cases like New Brunswick. We see a discussion in the jurisprudence uh, in all those CBC cases in the early 90s about what are the right terms and conditions when you're searching a media uh, organization to minimize the impact on privilege within the organization and so on. So you could term and condition up a regular warrant, but I just say I'm, I, yeah, I think a second warrant would probably be the easiest way to do it. So, but you'd have to be clear in your ITO that we're getting the computers out. We want them on our shopping list on our original warrant, <clears throat> and then we'll be seeking further authorization to search once they're out. I mean, that would be the historical kind of consi historically consistent approach, I guess. Do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I think that that's, that's my thought. I mean, I'm a crown, obviously, so <laughs> that's my pessimist question. Yeah. But that's been my general, that's been my reading of those. I've just had yeah. some resistance from the police on that point. So, yeah. um, but I don't think, I guess everything's not crystal clear yet. I mean, I, right. can see, I can see a rationale for yes, doing a very detailed explanation in the ITO of what you're going to do with the cell phone when you get it. And maybe if it is a more uh, complex investigation, maybe there's part six, you know what you're going to get right. when you get into the house. So you can speak to those things in a comprehensive way on that yeah. first initial warrant on the takedown day. So there might be some room to do it in those type of cases. But generally, yeah. I think on the, like on the door kicks, you probably want to do the second warrant. Yeah, I th well, for sure it's the safest way. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've all had, yeah. <laughs> Certainly in my former life, a million conversations with police officers saying, look, like, you know what, What's, why risk it? You might as well, yeah, work with an abundance of caution here, um, especially the more important the investigation gets. <laughs> so. We're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid, because there will be another class uh, coming in shortly. So I would ask you to join me in thanking Michelle for sharing some